Hi, I'm Kurt Fernley and welcome to One Plus One. That's Olympic 800 metre finalist Peter Boll and we're about to race. All right, Max, let's bump it up. Damn. Jack. Oh, no. <laughs> what? I'm getting smoked again. Oh, let's go. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's still good. Oh. <laughs> I gotta that practice. Is... Yeah, I lost it a couple of times. Harder than training. <laughs> wow. It's a lot easier on the track than here. Yeah. For sure. Peter Bolt, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you, thank you for having me. What a day it's been. Oh, mate, my blood pressure <laughs> is still coming down. I think I, I sweated more during that race than what I have for, I don't know, at least a couple of years. Um, Matt, are you very competitive? Super, and um, I mean, it didn't show during those racings earlier on, but yeah, super competitive. And it comes, I mean, it just comes from my background and, and my family. I, I have four brothers, so I think that's credit to them, being super competitive. My... Older brother just above me, he was pretty sporty and just super athletic, super talented. And I think my youngest brother is probably the most talented athletically in the family. So I think I just worked harder. Are they all competitive? <laughs> yeah, they're pretty competitive. When did you utilise that competitive nature in sport? When did you realise that it was an asset? Um, early on, like, I mean, everything relates to back, back. So when we first moved to Australia and, and I mean, we had to learn English and we're competing to see who we spoke English the fastest, so, I mean, that was awesome. And then we love football coming from Africa. We just played football every time and, and we just compete, like who can score the most goals, who is better, who can juggle more, all those little things. I think I am the most competitive person that I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think this morning I was, my competitive gene come on and it was just, you know, it's... It's game time. Uh, your 800 is uh, PB 144? 14400. No, I would go in that I'm 13271. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, uh, not, not, not that I'm that competitive. Yeah. <laughs> Mate, how fast can you run? I think it's always been in the cards. I've always wanted to run 142. They come around 200 metres left to go. Here comes Peter Boll, the Oceania record holder. I think I had it last year. It just wasn't necessarily in the fastest race and there were championship races. I mean, we've got two more years, so I think I've definitely got that in me, in my legs. Hunter, but Peter Boll's going to take the win. I started wheelchair racing when I was 13. You started when you were 17 years old, which is a late comer in the sport. What took you so long to get into it? I was, I was playing basketball and, I mean, I love team sports and I was playing ball with my friends and I was at school on a scholarship on basketball. And the only reason I really started running was because I wanted to be better at basketball. I wanted to be faster. I wanted to jump higher and I wanted to be fitter. I figured pretty early, like, the foundational is, is track and field. Like, you learn how to run, you, you learn drills and everything and you can convert that. And all I had to do in basketball is just keep, continue learning the skills. When did you find out you were... I'm not even going to say good. Um, when did you find out that you were great at athletics? Um, I found out I was great at athletics is when, when I won school carnival and then I went to ACC, which is the best thing other schools, and I came second and I was like, maybe you're not that great. Um, <laughs> and, and my teacher said, listen, like, I think if you, if you train and do athletics outside of school, you, you'll beat this guy. And it took me two years to listen to that advice. And, and when I did, I became the fastest in the school and then outside of school, then I entertained the idea of becoming the fastest in the state of Western Australia and then I was the fastest there. Then I was like trying to tick another box, like let's become the fastest in Australia. And then I ticked that off. It's like, let's become the fastest senior, tick that off. And then before you know, it's like, let's become the fastest in the world. And, and I mean, we still have that box to tick and we came fourth last year in Tokyo. So yeah, it's like really what I started trying to become the fastest in the school. It's become like, let's be the fastest in the world. What do you love about it? What do you love about the sport of athletics? 
I think everything outside of it, like the travel that I got to do, like I don't think I would have done that if I didn't do the sport. The cultures I got to meet, the people and the stories that you collect. Like I'm super competitive and I chase medals, I chase wins, but at the end of the day, man, like I don't really know where my medals are at. I do remember every story, every person I met along the way, and those are pretty powerful. So my medals, they sit in a Huggies box. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they sit underneath my little girl's bed. <laughs> yeah. Why is it that the medal seems like it's worth more to people around you than it does to the athlete in the middle of it? I think it's perspective. At the, at the time, like, when I'm setting my goals, I'm setting my goals for a medal because it's something like, like you almost know it's there. But the experiences and, and the people you get to meet, you can't really plan for that. I think those are unique and you just gotta, you just gotta let it flow. But the medals, you can kind of plan for them because like they're after grabs, you can plan for a medal. So that's why there's so much importance to them and, and you can come top three, but like, I don't know, I'm gonna end up in Paris, I'm gonna end up meeting new friends and travel around the world with. Those experiences just become natural. So I think that's why it's pretty important. Um, and it's, it's also healthy goals. Like you need to have extrinsic and external, external goals and internal ones. I think the internal ones are more powerful, but the external ones motivate you. Like, yeah, I, I want the medal. Like, I wanted to get a medal in Tokyo. More so, I just wanted to be in the podium and I wanted to be first because I believed I was first. Like, the medal was like irrelevant, whatever. But um, I wanted to be there representing the country. I wanted to be there representing my family and, and just be there. So I think that's it. Like, you can, plan, you can plan for a medal. You can't really plan for experiences and people you can't meet along the way. You didn't have any crowds in the stadium in Tokyo, but did you feel the immense support from Australia in that run-up to your 800 metres? Absolutely, and, that's, and that was a lot of courage. It was just powerful to know that. I think that's one of the most powerful things as an athlete is it's your journey, but it's how much that journey is impacting others. So that was probably my favourite part. And if I was like, do you feel pressure? I'm like, no, like, I mean, we're athletes. Pressure's a thing, nerves are a thing. It's like we just learn to kind of control them rather than try to avoid them completely. So you don't feel pressure at all? I just know how to manage it pretty well, yeah. I think. Uh, but not enough to kind of impact my performance. Like, coming fourth was not because of pressure. How do you see that fourth place? Uh, two ways. One, I was pretty disappointed because I wanted to be... I, I honestly thought I could win it, let alone get run out completely out of the medal chances. And then two, pretty powerful outside of the track because like the impact that you had outside of the track. So like performance wise, because I'm a, I think about high performance, I'm competitive, I'm in it for, for the best position. So of course that's a disappointment um, on my behalf. But like, man, like if we speak about being a better person than, than being an athlete, then we're ticking other boxes and, and they're pretty cool. When my parents would watch, well, my whole family would watch, uh, me race, there would be a, 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 a hole worn into the carpet because they were so stressed, right? Like they would walk up and down the house. I feel like they were feeling the nerves for me. But watching your, fa your family watch that race in Tokyo was one of the most joyous experiences that I think <laughs> yeah. Australia got to watch, you know? Like, it was a party. Beat up, beat up, beat up. What did you feel when you watched that back? I felt a lot of pride, like, you're just representing so many people. And, and the best thing, uh, as we say, athletics is pretty individual, but like it brought my family and my culture into the picture. And it brought my coaches into the picture. I've seen like, even I spoke about my teacher earlier on and she, she sat a bunch of interviews. Like, you know, it brought everyone that was part of the journey. And it's just like, you gotta understand like to make it to this stage, it's not an individual effort. It's, it's so much more effort, but um, I guess, a good question on my behalf, like, how did, how did you deal with pressure on leading up to major championships? Did you turn off your phones, speak to family? Because I think every, the unique thing is that every athlete does it differently. Completely. I, I'm going to out myself here. Yeah. <laughs> I would buy a big bit of Star Wars Lego <laughs> for, for every major competition because I needed that 24 hours before, not the day of, it was all good the day of, yeah. but the day before, I needed something that I went, step by step through to keep my mind off tomorrow. And then I also would remind myself that whenever I feel nervous, it means something exciting's coming. It means something means something to me. So it was like now when I go through periods of nerves, I actually get really excited as well. Yeah. Um, because I know around that corner, there's something of substance there that's waiting for me. That's, when you're... that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, 
I feel like my dirty little secret of Star Wars <laughs> Lego obsession is out. <laughs> uh, uh, what about your parents <laughs> or your whole family? Yeah. What did it mean to them to see you run in Tokyo and to see people kind of jump on board as well? It's like really powerful and I think it's, it's powerful because like Tokyo, I've been in Australia for 19 years, so um, like 19, 19 years before that, like myself and my family weren't Australian citizens or weren't even in the country. And then like 19 years on and you're like embraced by so many people in the country and, and you're representing the country. And on top of that, you're fourth in the whole world. So it's pretty powerful. And, and like, you know, we became Australian citizens and stuff like that. So, and I feel like it, it meant so much more to my, my parents because they've like hopped from country to country, from like Sudan to Egypt to Australia to try to give us better opportunities. And I feel like that was the result of those opportunities that they were trying to give us, like, like that we wouldn't have back home. That journey that your family came to become an Australian, what was that? Can you describe, you know, that process? Yeah, so born, I was born in, in Sudan, I spent six years in Sudan. Uh, my dad actually went to Egypt first, found a job and then brought us all over. And, and then so we moved from Sudan to Egypt, spent another four years there. And then at the age of 10, we got, we got accepted to Australia. Uh, and, and the good thing is the consistency here, and it's why, it's why family is so important to us, is, it's like the consistency is like we moved everywhere. So the locations weren't really that consistent where we moved. Like we, we can almost call every place home because we've been everywhere. Even when I moved to Australia, like you see, I started in Queensland, in Toowoomba, moved to Perth, now in Melbourne, and now we're doing this in, in Sydney. But the people remain consistent. So my parents and my, my brothers were everywhere that I moved to. So that's why it was so important to have that. Like, I feel like everyone's like, oh, you guys grew up disadvantaged, didn't have much. But no, we had, we had family, we had love, and we had each other. That's like more than we, what we needed back then. And, um, and my dad just felt like we needed more for us to grow up in a different country. And, and that's the move. You speak about your family with a lot of love and you speak about them even post-race and I, I feel like the Australian public also fell in love with your family. <laughs> yeah. Like, how does that, how does that sit, you know? Like, we all not just watched your race, we watched this, you know, <laughs> yeah. this beautiful display of emotion for, for, for you as well. Yeah. Man, it's, it's, like, it's Australia, like, we, we're super multicultural, so I think to get an opportunity to see other cultures, like, of course, the goal, the goal coming to this country is always like, you know you're going to be into a new culture and learn new things, like embrace all of that, but, but also like share a bit of your culture and share where you guys come from and, and what's important to you. So I think we got to share that part of our family and, and I think that's really important um, that we never lose sight of where we come from, but to share it and help other people understand like our values, our beliefs and, and why the way we are. And, and then I guess the overall goal is like, we should accept everyone like, and just, just understand like, they might come from different cultures, have different languages and this and that stuff. Like, it doesn't mean we can't all be together. A lot of Australia tells its story about culture through sport. You've been able to grab hold of that thing, right? And you're, you're creating your own Australian culture. You're, you're, you're creating your own piece of this tapestry of Australian sport, you know? Um, but you're doing it your way. You're speaking so openly, you're speaking so honestly, and has, has that kind of sunk in the impact that you're making? Oh, here and there, and I think we got back, you say speaking so openly, and I think it's, it's just the ability to be able to be like myself and comfortable in my own shoes, and which I had to develop and learn throughout the time. And I mean, I have stories from like, representing Australia for the first time. And I was, I was in Rio, Rio Olympics. And um, it's quite funny, I, was, I love analyzing cultures because I grow up with so many different cultures. My, my parents themselves, two different languages, two different tribes in the same country. Uh, so whenever I go to these teams, I'm analyzing people. And I remember being in, in Rio and I'm just analyzing everyone. I see the Jamaicans, I'm like, man, they're so cool. <laughs> like their Usain Bolt was there and they had music playing and they're just laughing. And then I saw like, the Kenyans and, and the East Africans, because I'm East Africans, we're, we're small, smaller, 
and they just look so shy and nervous. I'm like, man, I want to be like the Jamaicans. <laughs> they honestly look like they won the Olympics already. Um, and I was like, man, maybe not the Kenyans. They look so shy and nervous. Um, they might not perform well. And then the Americans looked a bit tense. The Australians were calm. And then you go there and then you realize, like when I got to the race and the Kenyans dominated my event and they're still dominated right now, I'm like, maybe it's just their culture and that's where they're from and, and that's just who they are. It doesn't mean they're nervous. It doesn't mean they're not going to perform just by body language. Um, it doesn't mean the Jamaicans have any more advantage than that. It's those who can truly be themselves and stand in their own shoes that are going to perform at the end of the day and not trying to spend so much energy trying to be like someone else. And growing up, I know I looked up to so many different athletes, but the goal is not to copy them. It's the goal is like to gain perspective and different insights and stuff like that and still keep who you are. And I feel like over the years, becoming a better athlete, I've become more and more myself and be just able to speak so freely about anything. What about that moment when you got the green and gold for the first time? What did that mean to you? Man, I just ripped through all those clothes. <laughs> um, I it's think, like Christmas, <laughs> Yeah, it? it's like you just rip through everything, put everything on, and um, you take photos of everything. I mean, I don't know, what did it feel like to you? Man, I loved it, but it did feel like Christmas. I, I actually probably spent uh, that first hour where I opened everything up, I put everything <laughs> on, I even, I would grab out what I like, what I don't like. Some of it went to next door neighbours. But <laughs> yeah. the first time is, is so, there's like a moment where you go, wait, this, this is for me. Yeah. Did you have that? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like you wear it and like you wear it with such pride and, and I don't know, like all clothes should feel kind of the same. I mean, different materials and whatnot but it's just something extra special. And like you've got, whether you've got the name across your chest, it's like, it's like, it's pretty cool when in athletics, when you're, you got the Australia here and then, and then down you got like your bib and then you got, you got bowl. So it's like you're representing Australia and then your family as well. Like, it's like the coolest thing ever. What makes you a great runner? Uh, the people around me for sure, uh, my support team. And we spoke about this before. Athletics is not as individual as, as you look there. You see me running by myself, but oh man, I've got a team, super team. Like you've seen my family on TV. You've seen my teacher earlier on, you know, pushing me to do athletics for two years, getting her dad involved to be my mentor. Uh, my first coach, Bernie Catley. You see my coach now, Justin Rinaldi, and how passionate he is about the sport. I always say this, like I've missed more training sessions than Justin has. Justin has been at every single training session and he's just always there sending training stuff. So like that. And then my agent, um, James Templeton, who's with me in Europe every year, trying to get me into different races, especially when I wasn't fast yet, trying to negotiate. Like, I think give this kid a chance. It's pretty hard to do when this kid's five seconds slower than everyone else. Um, and they're fighting for you, fighting for you. And um, so it's like a combination of everyone else. And honestly, I think as an athlete, um, the easiest thing is all I have to do is rock up the training and just run. <laughs> and the rest of the people take care of everything else. Um, you would have a pretty big support team. Well, I loved hearing that story where you say that your coach doesn't even tell you what you're doing until you're halfway through. Like, yeah. <laughs> I heard you tell a story where you didn't actually, you got three efforts into mile efforts maybe, yeah. and then you were like, so what are we doing? Well, <laughs> yeah. How long are we going for? So you're just, you turn up and you know your job and you do it. Yeah, and, and it's trust. Like, I mean, it's trust. It's important. At the same time, it's important to ask questions. Uh, but I don't ask too many questions of Justin because I've already asked so much questions. And I believe in Justin. I believe in his program. I believe in what he's doing. I mean, fair enough if I think there's something that, that maybe we need to do differently, especially as an athlete, like, your body's an asset. So you got to listen to your body. And the only conversation I would have with him, maybe if I'm sore here and there, I was like, okay, um, he's giving me a session here. I'm like, okay, can we maybe change it or can we do a cross training session, something like that, which is important. You don't always have to do everything he says uh, because then you'll start doing things even if you're hurting and whatnot. You gotta be, it's like a relationship, you gotta have a relationship and a relationship is open and you gotta be able to have conversations and speak and, and I think we got that perfectly at the moment. Like, I mean, at the Olympics, the question was like, what has your coach been telling you? It's like, what else? Like nothing, it's just like, go do what you know what you can. I mean, there's nothing else that he's gonna tell me. Like, we've already, we've worked for this over six years. It's like, it's on the day, it doesn't mean anything new. We're ready for this. Are you resilient? Yeah, yeah. Both in sport and outside of sport. And I think it had to come 
from outside of sport first. But Rio was my, my first Olympic Games. My first time to wear Australian uniform ever. I didn't go to World Juniors, nothing like that. Knocked out of, didn't make Commonwealth, didn't make Worlds, didn't make World Juniors. So you have to be pretty resilient to kind of continue going. It's, it's important. Then of course there's resilience off the track, that things that actually matter. Um, like having to move from spot to spot to spot with different family or having to come to a, new, a brand new country and, and just learn a brand new language. Like you have to be pretty resilient to do that. Um, the setbacks that you have, um, you know, and then there's also moving to a new country and there's this conflict in the middle where, where you, as, as a kid growing up, I grew up with Australians, I went to school with Australians and I was immersed in Australian culture. But as your parents, they're a bit older. They never got to go to school with Australians. So most of their friends are Sudanese, so they have this culture. And then so like you're in the middle trying to bounce through different two cultures. And then you have to, you have to be pretty resilient because if we're speaking being yourself and you're trying to grab two places, it's pretty hard. So you gotta keep be like right kind of in the middle in your sweet spot. Do you feel any pressure there where you know, as a Paralympian, you're always, uh, you're, you're not just that event. Mm. You, 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 you find yourself representing a community in the event as well as outside the event. How do you find yourself as, a, as an advocate for your community as well? Man, I just say I'm a global citizen and I represent everyone because I think it's a lot easier because I come from so many different communities. Um, just in sport, we have our own athletics track community. My mum is a Nuba, so she's from North Sudan. My dad is, is Denka, so he's from South Sudan. So like, I can't say I'm just representing one of the two. And then I'm an Australian citizen. I've lived in Egypt, so like, and I've got friends from all around the world. So I just say I'm a global citizen and try to represent. As long as I represent myself the best way I know I can, I think all the small communities that I'm a part of, um, they will get inspiration and, and, and feel like they've been represented well. And, and like we ha we've seen in Tokyo, it was, like, it was like everyone, it wasn't just like, it wasn't just the Sudanese or South Sudanese community that was supporting you. It was like, okay, from that community, it was like the whole continent. I felt like the whole African continent was supporting you. Um, you know, the Italians, um, the Australians, like whoever you want, like if they were into sport and they saw your story, they were, they were kind of supporting you. So it didn't matter um, where they came from and what small communities they came from. It just all became a big community. You talk about the power of purpose though. Mm -hmm. I've heard you speak about purpose quite passionately. What's your purpose? Um, I, yeah, I always speak about purpose because I think a sense of purpose gives you, like as an athlete, and I think you'd see this, um, you, of course you get motivations and whatnot and you have these goals, but when you have a purpose, and, and my purpose is always to represent myself and my family and my culture the best way I can. And, um, and I think the better I know, the better I can perform in athletics. It's a bigger platform to represent those people. So it gives me like, it gives me that more competitive, like, now nah, let's do it, let's, we can, we can get to the top, we can do this. And then that way, like, it helps people that come from the same path as me. No matter what country, same path. It started late, um, immigrated to this country. It gives them that, like, hope, like, man, you can achieve whatever you want. And I think that's, that's alongside of my purpose. Uh, but it's a pretty hard question. Like, if I ask you what's your purpose is, what would you say? Well, my purpose is to... It's a hard question. It's, it's a tough question, <laughs> isn't it? Because you want to, like, grab every single per thing. No, oh, I think that I do find a purpose in challenging, challenging misconceptions about mm. how people will see me and how they see my community. They see it in a way that I don't recognise. I don't recognise some of the times that people say, people in wheelchairs, people with disabilities, people, people Paralympians, I don't recognise the vision that they, they think I am, you know? So if I go out there and I do me, then maybe I drag them with me. Yeah. And they learn who we all can be. Yeah. Um, do you ever feel that? Yeah. Do you? Yeah, all the time. Uh, and I get it all the time now. I get so many people from, like, just messaging me and asking for advice and saying what a great inspiration you've been and I'm like I don't actually think I'm an inspiration or a role model I'm literally just doing me as you said and being myself and being comfortable in my own in my own shoes and doing what I love and I guess I think that's the that's the biggest thing is to to help people realize you can follow your own path and do what you love uh, and man, you'll be all right 
You're now one of the most celebrated athletes in the country. Sometimes I go down the street and I'm celebrated on one quarter, but then I can potentially be pitied because I'm in a wheelchair around the other. How do you reconcile this absolute celebration with, with a country that also has a... It definitely has a space where it plays in casual racism as well. Uh, well, one, I embrace those that support me and, and those that have supported me regardless. Like, you don't have to. It's, it's an unrealistic term to have on people to say, or immigrants or anyone to say, you gotta, you got to be the best in the world or some of the best in the world to be celebrated or to be accepted into society. It's, it's just unrealistic. Uh, and I, I, my goal is just to make sure, like, you know, to speak where I can. Like, you have, you have moments where, where, like, I'd be treated with so nicely, but someone else from the same community, it's just because maybe they're not, not as fast or not doing as well, be treated a little bit poorly. And, and, it's, and it's your goal to make sure you check that and just be like, no, like, just because I run two laps faster than, than him, it doesn't mean it's any different. We shouldn't be treated any differently. Um, you know, respect, equality matters. And, and I think, it's, it's, I think it's, it's kind of my duty to speak up for that uh, and not just to stay quiet. Does that come naturally or is that tough? It comes with practice. Nothing really comes that easily and that naturally. It comes with practice. You can only speak on what you can handle because some of these conversations are tough. Some of these conversations are draining. And, and a basic line for me is um, it's really hard to help, to help people if you're not in the right headspace. So you got to take care of yourself first, physically, mentally, and then you're more powerful to help others. Um, if you feel yourself like getting drained and the fuel is running low, you got to maybe leave those conversations, leave those tables, and then come back. You know, you don't want to compensate your own mental health or well-being in the process. What impact do you want to have? You're now a, a two-time Olympian. You're a silver medalist from the Commonwealth Games. You've had millions of people tune in for that, you know, one minute and 44 seconds and, and get so much joy out of that. Where do you want to see Peter Bowl? I think when, when you say that, I think about opportunity. I want to make sure that people get the opportunities that I've got along the way. Like, everything that I've done, everything that I've achieved would not be possible without the opportunities that come along the way. The opportunity to go to school, the opportunity to have a, a sports carnival, the opportunity to have coaches around, uh, the opportunity to be in a country where you can speak so freely and, and do what you want. So, uh, yeah. And I want, I want to see myself at another, at another Olympics. I want to see myself with, a, with an Olympic medal. Like, I know it's crazy. We spoke about the medals don't really matter. Um, and, and probably won't. Like, as soon as I get that medal, I'll, I'll pass it on to family or give it to my coach or, or whatever. But I want to I wanna see myself be in that podium in Paris. And, and beyond that, I want to I wanna be able to go back home where, where I was born and, and spend time there. There's so many things I want to do. And, and the great thing is, you know, it changes every time because you learn new things and you meet new people along the way. Well, Peter, I wish you the best. I can't wait to see where you go next. And thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure and can't wait to get back on those racetracks again. <laughs>